It is the 20th of August 1940 in Coyoacan, Mexico. A man in exile is writing in his study. He is interrupted by a Stalinist agent who has broken into his home armed with an ice axe. The pair struggle before the agent drives the ads of the axe into the man's skull, bungling his attack but penetrating his skull and brain. Too late, the man's bodyguards come to his aid, and he dies the following day in a Mexico City hospital. The man's name? Leon Trotsky. The man known to history as Leon Trotsky was born on the 7th of November 1879 in the small village of Yanovka, in what today is central Ukraine, but then was part of the Russian Empire. He was not born with the name by which he is popularly known, but was actually called Lev Davidovich Bronstein. His father was David Leontovich Bronstein, a relatively prosperous Jewish Ukrainian farmer. The family lived in a quite isolated part of Ukraine, which was over 20 kilometers from even the nearest post office. His mother was Anna Lovovna, and although the family was Jewish, they were not particularly religious, and Russian and Ukrainian were spoken at home rather than Yiddish, a language typically spoken by Ashkenazi Jews. When Leon was eight years old, his father sent him to school in Odessa the major city of the Crimea on the Black Sea in southern Ukraine. Here he was placed in an environment in which a historically multicultural city was becoming increasingly Russified, in line with imperial policy. From early on, his rebellious streak was evident, and while at Odessa, he organized a strike against an unpopular teacher. The world in which Trotsky was growing up was one in upheaval. For centuries, Russia had been underdeveloped politically, culturally and socially by comparison with its neighbors in Central and Western Europe. This began to change in the 19th century. Russia's population doubled between 1850 and 1900, coal production increased 12-fold during this period, while iron and steel production doubled. Great technological advances such as the train, telephones, and telegrams also brought Russia and Russians into much closer engagement with mainstream European ideas. Accordingly, a vast movement began from the mid-19th century to reform Russian society and end the autocracy and inequality which characterized Russian rule under the autocratic emperors or Tsars. In 1861, Russia became the last major European power to abolish serfdom under which approximately 40% of the Russian population had been effectively under the control of the landowners on whose estates they lived. Further reforms were in store. For instance, censorship of the press was relaxed, allowing for a greater dissemination of political ideas. New political groupings began to emerge in this more permissive political environment. For instance, Mikhail Bakunin founded modern collectivist anarchism in Russia in the mid-19th century, which theorized the complete dismantling of centralized state authority in response to the autocratic Tsarist regime. Other groups, such as the Emancipation of Labour Party and the Narodniks, argued for socialism in Russia in the 1870s and 1880s following the political ideas of the German political theorist Karl Marx. Their ideas began to find increasing support in Russia from 1891 onwards, following a catastrophic famine that year, which claimed the lives of approximately half a million Russians. Such was the unrest created by the famine that Orlando Figes, the leading English-speaking historian of revolutionary Russia, has argued that the roots of the Russian Revolution of 1917 can ultimately be traced back to 1891. The events of this time also appear to have been formative in the life of the young Trotsky. Writing towards the end of the 1920s, in an autobiography he wrote entitled My Life, an attempt at an autobiography, Trotsky stated of 1891 that it marked the official date of the political breaking point in this country. 
Trotsky was not alone in his thinking, and the struggles engendered by the famine led to the rising popularity of the Russian socialist movement in the 1890s. The disparate socialist groups eventually coalesced in 1898 to form the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, a revolutionary socialist party formed to unite Russian socialists in the cause of advancing the lot of Russian industrial workers. The teenage Trotsky was soon involved in these revolutionary political movements, and by 1896 he had relocated to the Black Sea town of Nikolaev, where he joined the Narodniks. A year later he helped organize the South Russian Workers' Union in the town. Early in 1898 he was imprisoned for the first time owing to political activities, but Lev Bronstein, the future Trotsky, was undeterred. And later in 1898 he joined the newly formed Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. Following his arrest at Nikolaev in 1898, Trotsky had been sent to Moscow to face trial for his actions in organizing revolutionary groups in southern Ukraine. After months of inaction in 1900, he was sentenced to four years' hard labor in Siberia, the thinly populated, vast region of eastern Russia which served as a penal colony for dissenters against the Tsarist regime. His life in the east was tempered somewhat by his marriage to Alexandra Sokolovskaya in the summer of 1899 as she accompanied him to Siberia, and two daughters, Zinaida and Nina, were born in the two years that followed. Lev Bronstein never served his full four-year sentence in Siberia. In the summer of 1902, at the urging of his wife, he escaped from the penal colony by hiding in the back of a hay wagon. As he made his way back to Europe, Bronstein reputedly utilized a passport he had obtained bearing the name of one of his jailers from Odessa several years earlier. The surname on the passport was Trotsky, and Bronstein now adopted it, along with an alternate version of his first name, Leon. As his revolutionary name, the name the world has known him by ever since. The newly free Leon Trotsky made his way to London after escaping from Siberia. Here he made contact with several leading members of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, who had gone into exile in England after the Tsarist regime of Nicholas II had cracked down on its membership. These exiles included Yorgi Plekhanov, a leading editor of the Russian socialist newspaper Iskra, or The Spark and also viewed as the founder of the social democratic movement in Russia in the 1870s. Trotsky, who is generally regarded as having been a highly accomplished writer and brilliant polemicist, was soon putting his own literary abilities to work with the newspaper. In London, Trotsky also came into contact with Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, or Lenin as he became known a figure of some controversy within the party. In 1902, Lenin had published a pamphlet entitled What is to be Done, which opened up a wide-ranging and divisive debate within the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party over the future of the party. On the one side were purists such as Lenin, who believed that the party should build its support exclusively around the industrial working class against the Tsarist regime, the landholders, and the bourgeois middle class while a separate faction argued that the party should seek the support of the middle class against the Tsarist government and the upper class of Russia. These divisions within the party came to a head at the Second Congress of the party held jointly in Brussels and London in August 1903. At this meeting, the party split into two opposing factions, known as the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. Bolsheviks means majority, while Mensheviks means minority which reflected the results of a vote held on the issue at the party congress. However, this somewhat confusingly did not reflect the actual support the two factions enjoyed. In reality, the Bolsheviks, headed by Lenin, had the support of only a minority of the party membership, while in the years ahead, the Mensheviks, led by Julius Martov, were the more popular and powerful of the two factions which resulted from the split of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party in 1903. Trotsky's initial response to this split in the party was to affiliate himself with the Mensheviks. However, by the autumn of 1904, he had become increasingly disillusioned with the Mensheviks' excessive courting of Russian liberals and the Russian middle class. As a result, he removed himself from affiliation with both the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, and would spend the next 10 plus years as a non-aligned, but nevertheless prominent, actor within the Russian socialist movement. 
Unbeknownst to Trotsky at the time, his departure from the Mensheviks occurred just as the cause of political reform in Russia was to undergo the greatest spurs to action that had been seen since the famine of 1891. On the 22nd of January 1905, Father Georgi Gapon led a large demonstration of unarmed protesters through St. Petersburg towards the Winter Palace of Nicholas II to protest against the firing of several workers from the Putilov ironworks in the city over their membership of a workers' assembly. The protest was peaceful, but the large crowds of thousands of people saw the deployment of thousands of Russian troops, and then in the late morning, gunfire broke out in numerous locations. Several hours later, when the dust settled, as many as 1,000 unarmed protesters and bystanders had been killed. Bloody Sunday, as the day has become known, inflamed opinions around the Tsar, Nicholas II, although he had not ordered the attacks. Strikes broke out in most cities and industrial centers throughout the country. This revolution of 1905 was further driven by Russia's loss in the Russo-Japanese War, the first major military defeat for a European war against an eastern state in modern times. In response to the escalating unrest caused by these events, Nicholas II re-established the Russian Duma or Parliament in an attempt to conciliate public opinion, but the country had entered into a phase of increasingly radicalized politics, particularly in the industrialized cities such as St. Petersburg, Moscow and Riga. In the tumult following Bloody Sunday, Trotsky elected to return to Russia from his exile in Western Europe and travelling through Kiev in his Ukrainian homeland, he returned to St. Petersburg in the spring of 1905. Once there, he again put his literary abilities to work and began writing for various underground newspapers associated with the Mensheviks. His activities placed him under observation and danger of arrest by the Tsarist regime, and within weeks of returning to St. Petersburg, he had to flee across the nearby border to rural Finland. Trotsky spent the second half of 1905 moving back and forwards between Finland and St. Petersburg. During this time, he took over the running of the Russian Gazette and increased its readership to some 500,000 Russian readers. It was during this time that Trotsky became highly influential in the formation of councils or Soviets of non-elected workers, established to represent the workers of the capital's factories. By the autumn of 1905, a St. Petersburg Soviet was in operation and had signaled its opposition to the Tsarist regime. Moreover, Trotsky temporarily served as its chairman. It was this role as a writer and lead agitator which led to Trotsky's second period of imprisonment. Late in 1905, government troops arrested many senior members of the St. Petersburg Soviet, including Trotsky. He spent much of 1906 in prison, before finally being convicted of inciting an insurrection in St. Petersburg. Thus, in October 1906, Trotsky found himself yet again sentenced to hard labor in Siberia. However, yet again, Trotsky would not serve his sentence. Indeed, on this occasion, he did not even make it to Siberia. While en route to the east in the winter of 1906 or 1907, he yet again escaped from official custody and made his way back west, eventually returning to London in the course of 1907. However, within a few months, Trotsky had relocated to Vienna, and it was at the capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire that he would conduct his work for much of the next decade. Here, he became involved from 1908 onwards with the Russian Marxist and psychoanalyst Adolf Joff in the publication of an underground Russian-language newspaper, Pravda, or Truth, which was smuggled into Russia. 1912 saw efforts to reunite the varying factions with the Russian socialist movement. In January, Lenin held a conference in Prague where the Bolsheviks were joined by a number of Mensheviks. Then in August, Trotsky held a further unification meeting in Vienna, but with little success. Beyond his involvement in the Russian socialist movement during his exile in Vienna, Trotsky was working on his theoretical views on Marxism. In 1908, he published Results and Prospects, a lengthy essay which built on some theoretical ideas he had conceived and written about in 1905, while in St. Petersburg during the aftermath of Bloody Sunday. These writings outline Trotsky's views on permanent revolution, his singular contribution to Marxist theory. Trotsky here developed the idea promulgated by Marx 
that sections of the middle class bourgeoisie would be required to carry out a revolution to implement proper political democracy and a redistribution of land and wealth as a step towards achieving a communist society. Trotsky argued that in Russia the bourgeoisie could not be relied on to contribute in this way to the revolution, and so the proletariat or working lower classes would have to assume the role of carrying out these tasks, a class struggle which would have to be permanent until communism was attained. This theory has gone on to have a substantial impact on Marxist thought beyond Russia and throughout the 20th century. In combination, these ideas of Trotsky's informed the development of the subfield of Marxism known as Trotskyism, which, at this early stage, was distinctive from Marxism in stressing the need for permanent revolution and support for social revolution in the more advanced capitalist countries through proletarian or working class agitation. Trotsky believed, somewhat in opposition to Marx, that permanent and gradualist social reform would be needed in these countries, whereas Marx had conceived society moving through different stages of development, first capitalism, then socialism, and finally attaining communism. Yet Trotskyism was still a fluid concept, and it would evolve in the years ahead in response to the actual experience of revolution in Russia. While living in Vienna, Trotsky had spent some of his time in 1912 covering the conflicts which racked the Balkans during this period. His perennial interest in class and ethnic struggles of all kinds was exhibited during this time. In his reportage on the Serbian army's policies of ethnic cleansing against the Albanian people, the Balkans shaped Trotsky's career in exile in more ways than one. It was here in the summer of 1914 that the murder of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, created the spark which eventually ignited into the First World War. By the end of August 1914, Europe was arrayed into two opposing alliances, Britain, France and Russia on one side, and Germany, Austria, Hungary and the Ottoman Empire on the other. As a Russian emigre, Trotsky was now forced to flee Austria-Hungary and resettled in neutral Switzerland where Lenin also moved to after a period of imprisonment in Austria. In Switzerland, Trotsky began working with the Swiss Socialist Party and wrote a book, The War of the International, in which he opposed the war, in contrast to a number of other socialist parties throughout Europe who had favoured the conflict for varying reasons based on domestic circumstances. It was this anti-war stance which saw the perennially nomadic Trotsky relocating again in 1916, and while in France early in the year, he was arrested, on account of his anti-war stance, and deported to neutral Spain, from where he was yet again deported to the United States. He was there by early 1917, and lived briefly in the Bronx in New York City. It was while he was in New York that the defining moment for the Russian socialist movement occurred. As with the Russian defeat in the Russo-Japanese War in 1905, Russia's performance in the World War which had swept Europe since 1914 had seriously destabilised the political situation at home in Russia. The Tsar, Nicholas II, had taken personal command of the Russian armies in 1915 and was viewed as personally responsible for a series of major military reverses on the Eastern Front. More critically, heavy borrowing and printing of money to pay for the war effort had seen rapid inflation in Russia, and by 1917 the cost of basic foodstuffs had increased fourfold than what they had been in 1914, pushing the poor to the point of destitution. This combined with increasing food shortages saw more radical political movements within the country gaining support. From his exile in Western Europe, Lenin called for the war effort to be turned into a civil war of the proletariat against the Tsarist regime. Within the government, this disaffection was not aided by the Tsar's family. Nicholas II's wife Alexandra, the Tsarina, was originally German, and her nationality became a focus for criticism and suspicion, as Russia found itself losing the war to Germany. Moreover, the royal family had begun to place an increasing amount of faith in the abilities of Grigory Rasputin, a mystic who had befriended the Tsar's family, and who popular opinion increasingly saw as being the power behind the throne in St. Petersburg. And although he was assassinated on the 30th of December 1916, his rise had severely tarnished the reputation of the imperial family in the mid-1910s. 
social, political and economic factors coalesced early in 1917 into severe unrest in St. Petersburg, or Petrograd as it was called after 1914, a city whose population had grown from approximately 1 million in 1890 to over 2 million in 1917, many of whom were poor, overworked and severely disaffected industrial workers. In early February 1917, workers in Petrograd began strikes and demonstrations throughout the city. In particular, strikes began at the Putilov Mill, by far the largest employer in the city with upwards of 20,000 workers. The strike here was sparked by the company reneging on a pay increase, which had been promised to allay the workers' difficulties over the food price increase in the capital. When a lockout from the factory began after the strike, further demonstrations occurred throughout Petrograd, and by early March, well over 100,000 workers were protesting throughout the capital. The Russian Revolution had begun. Things moved quickly. The Tsar was absent from the capital at the Eastern Front, but commanded the army to intervene to suppress the rioting and demonstrations in the capital. This move backfired, however, as many of the rank-and-file soldiers either refused to comply or simply deserted. The Russian parliament, the Duma, now moved to establish a committee to establish law and order, while measures were underway to also establish a Soviet or city council of the industrial workers of Petrograd. Meanwhile, Nicholas II, on his way back to the capital from the Eastern Front, was facing increasing pressure to abdicate as the situation in Petrograd spiralled out of control. Confronted by senior members of the Russian military and urged to do so, he abdicated on the 15th of March 1917 in favour of his brother, Michael. However, realising that he lacked the support to restore order, Michael Romanov refused the title of Tsar the following day. Accordingly, on the 16th of March, the Russian Empire of the Tsars effectively came to an end. A provisional government now came to power, headed by a liberal aristocrat, Prince Lvov. And while power within Petrograd itself largely lay with the Petrograd Soviet, over the next eight months a power struggle would play out between these two contenders for power, the aristocratic conciliar government and the populist socialist Soviet. When news of the events in Russia reached Trotsky in New York, he immediately began preparing to return to his homeland. He departed the United States on the 27th of March 1917. While crossing the Atlantic, he was detained for a month at Nova Scotia. Trotsky's commitment to the workers' struggle was evident here. While detained at a British internment camp, he helped organise mass meetings and workers' agitation. Eventually, the British government released him at the end of April, and he reached Russia in mid-May. Finally, back in Petrograd, he became a major player in the struggle which was materialising. Lenin had returned to the capital from Western Europe in mid-April, and had quickly established the Bolsheviks as one of the foremost groups in the divided politics of Russia in the weeks after the February Revolution. Despite his non-alignment with either the Bolsheviks or Mensheviks in the years gone by, Trotsky now drifted towards Lenin's position, which increasingly sought to overthrow the provisional aristocratic regime and establish a socialist government. Government crackdowns on some of the more militant groupings in Petrograd had seen Lenin flee over the border into Finland. However, a failed attempt by the military to seize power in Russia and place General Lave Kornilov in charge of the government in September 1917 saw Lenin return to the capital in October. Upon his return, the Bolshevik Central Committee voted to launch a revolt and seize power. In response not only to the failed military coup d'etat, but also major military reverses on the Eastern Front, which had seen the German army advancing into Russia itself after seizing Poland and Lithuania. Trotsky's role in inciting the revolution which followed Lenin's return to the capital cannot be overstated. He authored the resolution which was passed by the Petrograd Soviet on the night of the 22nd of October, which specifically called for the creation of a military revolutionary center to facilitate the revolutionary defense of Petrograd and the safety of the people from the attacks being openly prepared by military and civil Kornilovites. 
The resulting revolt occurred on the night of the 7th of November 1917, but has become known as the October Revolution, having occurred on the 25th of October according to the Julian calendar, which was in use in Russia at the time. The Revolutionary Military Committee had appointed Trotsky as its chairman, and he was instrumental in the seizure of power in Petrograd through the October Revolution by bringing the garrison in the capital over to the Bolsheviks' cause. As a consequence, within 24 hours of the inception of the revolt, many government buildings in the capital had been occupied, and on the 9th of November, the Winter Palace, the seat of government itself, fell under the control of Lenin, his party, and the Petrograd Soviet. Thus began the long and checkered history of the Soviet state. Within days, the new Soviet state began to tighten its control over Russia, with Moscow declaring in favor of the new regime on the 15th of November, major policy changes were quickly made to begin creating a communist state. All private property was nationalized, as were the Russian banks. Foreign debt was defaulted on. The vast properties of the Russian Orthodox Church were taken into state possession, while factories were placed under the control of workers' Soviets, the members of which were given pay increases and had their working day reduced to eight hours. Trotsky's star was in the ascendant in the first weeks of the new Soviet state, following his role in the October Revolution and the regard he was held in by members of the Petrograd Soviet in these early days of the revolution. Nobody other than Lenin was more powerful within the new regime, and his role in the months that followed reflected this status as the second most powerful figure in the government of Soviet Russia. Trotsky was appointed as People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs in November 1917, the Soviet equivalent of Minister for Foreign Affairs. His first task was the war effort, which Russia was losing badly in 1917. His first act was to publish the terms of the Triple Entente, the alliance between Britain, France and Tsarist Russia, which stated the alliance's agreements to redraw Europe's boundaries and redistribute the Central Powers' lands amongst them in the conflict's aftermath as new colonies in Africa and the Middle East. This betrayal of British and French intentions effectively ended the Triple Entente and put Russia in a war on its own against Germany. At the same time, Trotsky began peace negotiations with the German government in Berlin to bring Russia's involvement in the First World War to an end. These began in December 1917. From the very beginning, the Germans laid out highly punitive terms which involved their annexation of huge tranches of the Russian Empire around modern-day Poland, the Ukraine, and the Baltic Sea region. The government in Petrograd was highly opposed to such terms, but from early 1918 it was facing increasing opposition from within central Russia to the establishment of the Soviet state, with a major civil war brewing at home, and the Russian army in no state to undertake a resumption of the war on the Eastern Front, the regime reluctantly agreed to most of Germany's terms in the spring of 1918. Trotsky, who was loath to agree to territorial concessions to a capitalist regime, refrained from casting a vote in the decision to accept the German terms which he had overseen the negotiation of. He had hoped that while the negotiations were underway, the German proletariat would overthrow the Kaiser's government in Berlin, but his optimism in the revolutionary cause proved unfounded on this occasion. Under the terms of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, Signed on the 3rd of March 1918, and named for the Belarusian town where it was agreed, the infant Soviet state ceded all of Russia's territories in Poland and the Baltic states of Lithuania, Estonia and Latvia to Germany, as well as some territories in the Caucasus and Caspian Sea region to the Ottoman Empire of Turkey. Russia also recognized the independence of Finland, Ukraine and Georgia thus creating new buffer states on its borders. The total losses amounted to over 1 million square miles of Russian territory at 55 million people, as well as a huge proportion of Russia's coal, iron, and steel factories. Lenin was clear that this was an utter humiliation, but the treaty provided the Soviet state with time to secure itself at home against its domestic enemies. These enemies were multiplying in the spring of 1918 as the Russian Civil War spread throughout the country as far as the Pacific Ocean, and by the time peace was established with the Germans, the Bolsheviks' enemies, a broad coalition of aristocrats, former supporters of the Tsarist regime, Cossacks, army officers, the Orthodox Church, 
Centrists and even leftists who were opposed to the Bolsheviks had begun organizing themselves into an opposing White Army, in opposition to the Soviet Red Army. They acquired significant foreign backing in the shape of aid from Britain, France, the United States, and Japan, less significantly other groupings such as the Black Army and Green Army arose in regions such as the Ukraine to fight for local rights in these areas against the Soviet regime in Petrograd. Having led the peace negotiations with Germany, Trotsky now took center stage in the civil war effort, and in mid-March, just days after the finalization of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, he resigned as People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs, and was then appointed as People's Commissar for Military and Naval Affairs. Thus, at the height of the Civil War, Trotsky was effectively placed in charge of the Soviet war effort. The initial problems facing him were the small size of the Red Army and the lack of professionalism within it. Consequently, his first act was an enormous recruitment drive, and within six months of his taking charge of the Red Army, its numbers had swelled from 300,000 men to 1 million troops. Eventually, this would increase to 3 million men as new fronts opened, particularly in Poland from early 1919 onwards, as Polish separatists undertook the Polish-Soviet War, backed in particular by Britain and France to establish what eventually became the Second Polish Republic. Trotsky's methods as Commissar for Military and Naval Affairs could be brutal. In order to instill greater discipline in the rank and file, he devised the notorious blocking units, special units which were placed behind the front line of the Red Army's troops, charged specifically with gunning down any of their own soldiers suspected of trying to desert or retreat. Many years later, in his autobiography, he laid out his thoughts on this. An army cannot be built without reprisals. Masses of men cannot be led to death unless the army command has the death penalty in its arsenal. So long as those malicious, tailless apes that are so proud of their technical achievements, the animals that we call men, will build armies and wage wars. The command will always be obliged to place the soldiers between the possible death in the front and the inevitable one in the rear. These blocking units remained a common feature of the Red Army for many years, and were used extensively again during the Second World War. But beyond this brutal tactic for enforcing discipline on the rank and file in the Red Army, as Commissar for Military and Naval Affairs, Trotsky was also a firm proponent of the Red Terror, the ruthless suppression of political dissent within the military establishment, and the use of labor camps to provide arms and other supplies for the war effort. As a zealous revolutionary and communist, he believed that such measures were justifiable insofar as they would lead to the destruction of the propertied classes and the initiation of a new global socialist world order. In this respect, the example that he set during the Russian Revolution spoke of an individual who could display a savage streak which was often out of step with his concern for the rights of the downtrodden proletariat, and many of his methods shaped the autocracy and violence of the Soviet state in the years and decades ahead. Trotsky's command of the Red Army had also brought him into conflict for the first time with Joseph Stalin, a rising star of the Soviet regime from Georgia, who had established himself as one of Lenin's closest confidants in 1917 and had been given command over elements of the army in 1918, particularly on the southern front in the Caucasus near his native Georgia. In the autumn of 1918, Trotsky sought to appoint General Pavel Saitin as commander of the Red Army in the south. But Stalin successfully blocked his appointment, the first in a series of increasingly antagonistic clashes between the two figures which would have serious implications for the Soviet state in the years ahead. Late 1919 saw the tide turn in the Civil War. At that time, various White Army factions, Polish forces, and the military contingents of newly independent states such as Finland and Estonia, all backed with foreign support from Britain, the United States, and France, threatened Petrograd and Moscow. However, after the breaking of a brief siege of Petrograd in the late autumn, the Red Army finally went on the offensive in the winter of 1919-20. With the end of the Polish-Soviet War in 1920 and the British retreat of their forces from Central Asia, following which rapid advances were made in 1920 and 1921. 
Eventually, the civil war was brought to an end in October 1922 when Vladivostok, the last White Army-held city on the Pacific coast of Russia, fell to the Red Army. When the fighting stopped, the Soviet state had lost some of the territory formerly held by the Tsarist Russian Empire, notably in Poland and the Baltic region, where the new states of Poland, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania had fully established their independence. However, Russia had retained most of its territories, including Belarusia and Ukraine. With the establishment of peace after five years of revolution, civil war and unrest, the focus of the Soviet state turned to rebuilding and restructuring the economy in line with socialist principles. And in 1921, Lenin's government began introducing the new economic policy, a market-orientated economic policy which allowed individuals to own small amounts of private property and included various other elements of a capitalist system. The NEP, as it became known, was conceived as a temporary retreat from more radical socialist policies while the civil war emergency persisted. It was fiercely opposed by Trotsky, who had placed himself by the early 1920s as the far left of the Soviet hierarchy, a government which was headed by Lenin, but which was not a dictatorship like that which emerged in the 1930s under Stalin. Trotsky effectively believed in line with Marxist and socialist principles, that the state should have complete control over the allocation of all output, and that Russia should develop an exemplary command economy. Nevertheless, the NEP was adopted despite the objections of Trotsky and the other members of the left wing of the Soviet leadership. Indeed, it lasted well beyond the cessation of the war, and was the central basis of the Soviet economy until 1928. Meanwhile, as the civil war was being brought to an end, Lenin's health had begun to deteriorate, opening up serious questions about who would succeed him as head of the Soviet state. He suffered three strokes between May 1922 and March 1923, finally culminating in partial paralysis and loss of his motor functions, including the ability to speak. When he eventually died on the 21st of January 1924, the Soviet hierarchy, or the Politburo as the leadership had become known, had been preparing for his passing for over two years. As Lenin's health had deteriorated from 1921 onwards, it had become apparent that there were two major figures who might succeed him as the ostensible head of the Soviet state, Trotsky or Stalin. From the October Revolution of 1917 onwards, Trotsky had effectively been number two in the administration only to Lenin, and his leadership of the Red Army had cemented the wider public perception of Trotsky as the successor designate to Lenin. However, within the Politburo things had begun to shift, as Ellis, often aloof and introverted intellectual, Trotsky was not the most naturally gifted or ruthless of politicians. His opponent was, however, and as Lenin's health deteriorated, Stalin had obtained the position of Central Committee General Secretary, through which he exercised enormous powers of patronage within the government. Between his appointment as General Secretary in 1922 and Lenin's death in January 1924, Stalin focused on building a coalition within the Politburo to support him and undermine Trotsky's position. He was also responsible for overseeing the creation of the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics in December 1922, or the USSR as it became known. Stalin's ascent was particularly assisted by the formation of a triumvirate of himself and two of the other most senior members of the Politburo, Lev Kamenev and Grigory Zinoviev. This troika would allegedly share much of the power in a post-Lenin world by opposing Trotsky's succession to Lenin. Lenin had his suspicions about Stalin. They were significant enough that in 1923, shortly before his third stroke effectively incapacitated him, he changed his last will and testament to warn the party about Stalin and anoint Trotsky as his successor as head of the Soviet state. Nevertheless, by mid-1923, Stalin's monopolization of power was far too advanced. By now, he had used his position as general secretary to place his followers in many mid-ranking offices, and his alliances within the higher brass of the Politburo held firm in their support for him against Trotsky. In 
At first, Lenin's death in January 1924 seemed to usher in little explicit change in the workings of the Soviet government. The revolutionary government's first leader had been effectively incapacitated for months prior to his death anyway, and following his passing, the Politburo seemed to go on governing by collective assent, much as it had done in 1922 and 1923. However, the reality was quite different to the initiated. The Troika of Stalin, Kamenev and Zinoviev now effectively predetermined the decisions that were made by the Politburo. Moreover, Trotsky's diminished position was signified and made public a year after Lenin's death when, on the 6th of January 1925, he was removed from his position as Commissar of Military and Naval Affairs and even his chairmanship of the Revolutionary Military Council, the position he had occupied in 1917 as arguably the single most decisive character in the inception of the October Revolution. He was allowed to retain his position as a member of the Politburo, but Trotsky increasingly found himself ostracized from any real power within the Soviet regime. 1925 saw Trotsky becoming an increasingly isolated and remote figure, estranged from effective power and outside the decision-making circles he had once been so prominent within. When the Troika of Stalin, Kamenev and Zinoviev broke up later in the year, and Stalin turned against his erstwhile allies, Trotsky is notable only for playing no role in the machinations that followed their downfall. Stalin's split with Kamenev and Zinoviev ushered in the final episodes in the scramble for power in the post-Lenin years, and ultimately the last acts of Trotsky's career as a revolutionary in his homeland. At the 14th Congress of the Bolshevik Party in Moscow in December 1925, he allied with Kamenev and Zinoviev against Stalin and his faction to form what has been termed the New Opposition. The speeches laid bare that this was now a fight for control of the party, but it was ultimately one in which Stalin was victorious in the months ahead. The death knell of opposition to Stalin's monopolization of power within the Bolshevik party and the Soviet state did not finally come until 1927. In October, Trotsky and Zinoviev were expelled from the Central Committee, when they then attempted to organize counter-events to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the Bolshevik seizure of power in October 1917. The police intervened to break these up, and in early November, the pair were expelled from the Communist Party. Eventually, Kamenev and Zinoviev capitulated to Stalin at the 15th Party Congress in December 1927. However, Trotsky refused. As a consequence, in January 1928 he was removed to Kazakhstan, east of the Caspian Sea, before being deported to Turkey a year later. Consequently, the lifelong revolutionary yet again found himself exiled from Russia. He would never return. Perhaps Trotsky's fate was better than those who remained. Russia, in the years of Trotsky's last exile in the 1930s, descended into paranoia, terror and bloodshed as Stalin tightened his grip on power. Other dissenters in the years ahead, who favoured Trotsky's approach to communism, often faced hard penal labour in Siberia. Many more were disappeared or killed by Stalin's regime. The culmination of this reign of terror was the Moscow show trials when Sergei Kirov, a senior Bolshevik politician, was assassinated on the 1st of December 1934. His murder was used as a pretext for the removal of Stalin's former allies, Lev Kamenev and Grigory Zinoviev, who had formed the Troika with Stalin in the mid-1920s and who had helped him to reduce Trotsky's influence within the party. They were arrested, found guilty of involvement in Kirov's murder, and both were executed by firing squad on the 25th of August 1936. The Great Purge or Great Terror of 1937 and 1938 followed, during which Stalin and his secret police wiped out all opposition to the regime in Russia by branding individuals as opponents of the state and Trotskyists. When all was said and done, as many as 1.2 million people died in these years, either through judicial executions or, more commonly, in the horrendous conditions of Stalin's forced labour camps, known to history as the Gulag. Consequently, Trotsky outlived nearly all those who remained behind in Russia and opposed Stalin in any fashion, and after his departure from Russia, he spent four years in Turkey, before then living in France for two years, between 1933 and 1935. 
He was then moved on by the French authorities, and he departed for Norway. But following official pressure from Russia, he was deported to Mexico, and arrived there early in 1937. It was his last place of exile, and he would eventually die there in 1940. His last years in exile were not spent idly. He remained a prolific writer, writing several books including his History of the Russian Revolution and his autobiography. He also worked with the Socialist Workers' Party of the United States while in Mexico, and gained supporters amongst members of the Chinese Communist Party, which was undertaking its long and bitter struggle to gain control of China. Moreover, in 1938, he and his supporters founded the Fourth International a communist revolutionary and internationalist alternative to the Stalinist Comintern. It was almost certainly this continued activity and Trotsky's never-ending revolutionary zeal which led to his death. Fueled by the paranoia under which all of Russia was suffering in the 1930s, Stalin had determined, in the latter part of the decade, to dispense with Trotsky permanently, even in faraway Mexico City. On the 24th of May 1940, Trotsky survived a raid on his home by Stalinist assassins. Three months later, however, another Stalinist agent was successful. On the 20th of August 1940, Ramon Mercader, a Stalinist agent, broke into Trotsky's home in Mexico City and drove an ice axe into Trotsky's skull. The blow was poorly delivered, and it was not until the following day that Trotsky finally died in a Mexico City hospital. Thus died the man who was born as Lev Bronstein, but who was known to the world as Leon Trotsky. He was one of the most fascinating figures of Russian history, a deeply committed socialist and believer in the cause of communism. He spent his entire adult life fighting for that ideal, twice fleeing exile to the penal colonies of Siberia and spending 15 years as a revolutionary nomad between Russia, London, Vienna, Switzerland and the United States before finally returning triumphantly to Russia in 1917 and playing a leading role in the October Revolution. Following the creation of the Soviet state, he was instrumental in the civil wars that followed, essentially becoming the key figure in the early professionalization and development of the Red Army as a formidable revolutionary army. But Trotsky's abilities and intellectual significance extended beyond his practical impact on the government of early Soviet Russia, to his role in shaping the very nature of communism itself in the 20th century, particularly with the theory of permanent revolution, which influenced communist thinkers in Africa, the Caribbean, and Latin America for decades to come. Yet there was also a paradoxical quality to Trotsky. At times a seemingly humane man, committed to workers' rights and the good of the proletariat, he could also be brutal in defense of the cause of revolution, as his development of the concept of blocking units within the Red Army testifies. Overall, though, his ruthlessness was no match for that of Joseph Stalin. In the power struggle which followed Lenin's death in the mid-1920s, Trotsky ultimately ended up the loser, and his latter years were something of an anticlimax. Spent yet again in exile from Russia as his rival for power plunged the new Soviet state into years of autocracy, repression and bloodshed. What do you think of Leon Trotsky? Was he a humane revolutionary under whose influence the history of Soviet Russia could have been spared the worst excesses of Stalin's regime? Please let us know in the comments section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Hello guys, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy our work and would like to support the channel, please visit our revamped Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee membership pages, which contain rewards, such as early access to our content, merchandise discounts, and audio versions of our videos, along with much more that we give to our valued supporters. If you have not yet signed up to help our cause, we'd like to ask you to please consider doing so, as we need to secure the channel by safeguarding it from possible demonetization, and also invest in better equipment software, and more people to help us improve our videos going forward. In short, without your contributions, these videos would not be possible. So if you would like to ensure this channel never has to shut down due to demonetization, please spare whatever you can per month and become People Profiles patrons. Thanks for listening.